Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for the Rapid Change Management webinar number seven, uh, which is titled Challenge to Get Your HR Budget Approved. Let's talk to the CFO. Uh, we're glad you joined us. I am Brennan German, president of Bright Talent, and I'll be your facilitator today. Uh, Renee Maurer uh, is our head of operations, and she's going to be our moderator. Uh, she will turn off her camera in the in a minute and be the voice behind the scenes as she's going to come back on and help us uh, with the Q&A. So as you ask us questions, she will read those off to us uh, as you do that. And then uh, we have our guest speaker today, uh, Michael Rodriguez. I will give him more of a proper uh, introduction in a minute after I give the context uh, to the webinar. So um, this webinar is part of what we call our Rapid Change Management Series. So I'm going to pull up our website here so I can share with you where you can find that. Let's make sure this works. So uh, when you come to our website, you will uh, see that we have a resources page. You're going to click on that resources page and you will be brought to guides. And uh, these are free resources that we provide our HR community. And uh, the Rapid Change Management Series is here. You will click on that, but I'm gonna go off topic just for one second. We also provide a care assistance program. That's where we provide free mental health, psychological, spiritual support for you or your family just as part of our HR community. So a lot going on in this world today. So if you feel like you're feeling a bit overwhelmed, we'd love to help you. And this is all confidential and we partner with the third party called Marketplace Chaplains that provides these services. So that is there for you. But back on topic, uh, you would click on the Rapid Change Management Series and you're going to be brought to the home page. And uh, after we are recording this webinar and after we're done with this webinar, we will upload it for on-demand viewing. And so you would come to this page to see it. So we on this page, we have a change management playbook. So for those of you that are going through change, we have all kinds of project management tools for you. Uh, we also, if you don't want to be self-service, we also can help you. And then we have the webinars. And so you would click on this page uh, to get to the webinars. And if you scroll down, most of you might've come here to register for this webinar. And below that, you will find all of our recorded webinars from the past. And so this is where you would find this webinar uh, when we are finished. So uh, we just wanted to make sure you knew how to navigate and find us again. Now, in regards to the webinar today, the format, I'm a real fan of podcasts. So I like that conversational style uh, and kind of discussion. So that's what we're going to really be following today, even though I call it a webinar. And it's short. We just want to be concise and to the point. We're not going to be a, a Joe Rogan two-hour session here. This is going to be 30 <laughs> minutes. And I know Michael doesn't even have that kind of time. So just let you to join us today for 30 minutes. And so we'll talk for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then we'll have about five to 10 minutes of Q&A. Uh, at the end. So while Michael and I are talking, if you have questions, use that Q&A portion of this webinar, Zoom webinar tool. And then again, Renee at the end uh, will pick those up and ask those on your behalf. So with that, today's topic is about budgeting. And we are in budget season for a lot of us that run annual uh, financials. And uh, I, as I've met with different folks out in the HR community. This is top of mind. And as I thought about this topic, I was very fortunate to have worked with Michael uh, earlier in our careers for a novel IT staffing company called Direct Fit. And I immediately thought Michael would be awesome, would be the perfect person to talk to because not only has he been a CFO for both startups and established companies, he's also been on the business side uh, doing strategy as well. And now he's teaching accounting at uh, Baylor University. So. So he is, I think, overqualified to talk about this, and I'm excited that he's here <laughs> to join us. And we're going to try to stay, just because we've got such a short amount of time, we're going to try to stay concise. We're going to just cover quickly strategic planning, and then really, how do we take that and then put it into practice? So that's going to be the key two topics that we talk around. And so now let me give the proper introduction of Michael. So Michael has over 30 years experience successfully leading both public and early stage businesses across multiple industries. Currently, he is Clinical Assistant Professor of Accounting at Hancomer. Am I saying that right, Michael? Hancomer? You are, absolutely. Hancomer. Okay. School of Business at Baylor University. Michael also serves as a board member of the Lewis Tree Company and advisor to Waco Ventures and We Create Media. 
Prior to this, he served as Chief Business Officer and CFO for Magnolia Business Ventures, and this is the global brand associated with the Fixer Upper franchise. And he's also been CFO and COO for Clarent Diagnostic Services, which was acquired by GEL Healthcare Company. And then he has a BS in accounting from uh, USC, that is the University of Southern California, and an MBA from Stanford University. And uh, we're just so glad you're here, Michael. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. I felt like for a second I was hearing my epitaph, but that's <laughs> totally great. <laughs> he was a good man. <laughs> so just to dive in, strategic planning, I always think of, okay, where do we start? So so many HR leaders uh, hold the budget for all the people practices. So, you know, this is a good thing and this could be a bad thing because then sometimes business leaders rely too much on HR to do things where they might maybe be doing themselves. So so but more importantly, when HR walks into budget season and they're sitting in front of the CEO and the CFO and they're talking about what they need. How I, I'm always kind of curious, how is the CFO looking at the HR person? How are they looking at their budget? Because we know as HR leaders, we are a cost center. And unless you're really in a very strategically oriented business and they're looking at HR as a pure strategic partner, a lot of businesses look at HR kind of as that ad, perhaps administrative function. So, so how do you think CFOs kind of look at the HR budget when we're sitting down and we're parceling things out? Yeah, you know, I obviously I can't speak for all CFOs. I mean, I have tons of conversations from time to time with people who are sitting in the seat. Uh, you know, from my perspective, ultimately, yeah, you know, you can look at HR as a cost center, but I look at it rather from a more of a balance sheet perspective. If I'm going to get super financial yeah. about it. Yeah. When I think about our HR leaders, what they're overseeing is the most significant, most valuable asset that we have on the balance sheet of the business. It, it, you know, you can talk about machinery, you can talk about factories, you can talk about all of that stuff, but there's really no greater, more valuable asset. And so with that said, I think, you know, my hope is, and the way I've tried to lead over the years is, is having a, a partnership with the head of HR long before you're having that budget meeting. Like, like that relationship, when you think about if the CFO is overall seeing over the financial resources of the company, the cash and all of that, and the human resource leader is really responsible for the other most significant asset in terms of people, then their cadence with one another, that needs to be constant it needs to be consistently kind of, you know, calibrated all of the time. Yeah. And when they're walking in to sit down with the CEO, let's just say together, it really does need to be together. And so my thing is have the conversations strategically throughout the year. Certainly most budget processes are going to commence with, you know, kind of starting with strategy. But we also need to be executing strategy every single day. We ought to be evaluating our, our process towards achieving strategy every single day. And, and the resources that come together are found most, you know, kind of saliently within you know, the CFO seat and the human resource leader seat. Yeah, that makes sense. And then I just think of when I think of budgets, my mind goes to, OK, I, I parcel it out to software, I parcel it out to headcount, I parcel it out to training and development, travel, gifts, whatever it is. So as we look at it inside of a business and I'm HR and I've got all these different pieces, um, is there a way to segment? each piece and try to tie it to revenue and profitability instead of always being viewed as a cost center, if that makes sense. Like, yeah, I've like seen that, you know, it, it, we could always say sales marketing, it's easy, right? We can kind of see, yeah. how do we do that in HR, perhaps? Well, and I think it's right along with, with what you said, it, you know, cost center has really, I think, relatively bad uh, kind of a, a association. When you hear that, you're just like, oh, we're just a drag on the rest of the business. And, and I just don't see it that way. And, and at the end of the day, I, I don't think that it's erroneous to look at HR as a profit center in most regards, or the budgeting process as evaluating a bunch of profit generating investments that we make from time to time. Um, and, and yeah, I have seen before where we're looking at a number of different metrics where you're evaluating the productivity and the contribution to the business's success of assets like software, of assets, you know, like factories or facilities, and yes, our people. And, you know, you can do that in a variety of ways. Like, let's just look at on a per headcount basis, if you want to call it that. How is the profitability of our business or how is the, the cost that is being invested in any one particular segment within our business? How does that work from a leverage point of view? In other words, how much does each person participating in that particular segment of the business 
how much are they contributing in effect to the overall success of the business, whether profit or any other things like that. And so again, it's not to talk about people in, you know, in, in human perspective, but that asset, as it were, can have a return on assets like any other asset class. And yeah. I, I do think we have to look at that and say, look, what is our, what is each team contributing? And then I think we have to honestly think through the fact that not every asset we have in our portfolio contributes equally, but they need to be contributing optimally. And that's a separate and distinct evaluation. And so, you know, whether we have 10 people in this department or 50 people in that department, it's right. not apples and apples. And if we get to the point where we're trying to think that way, we can really get in kind of a mess. And I think that's that I love that word optimal. Um, and I think that's what you're saying, that relationship all year round. What mm -hmm. does that mean? What does optimal mean? And I think that's what's key for heads of HR, right? That's yeah. the measurement that we need to work with the CFO to report back to the CEO what optimal is and are right. we reaching that optimization. Um, and I think of simply right now, I'm, uh, we're talking to a lot of different customers that are evaluating their software renewals. Are we going to renew or right. not? And I know there's a lot of software companies worried right now because of yeah. business uncertainty and things. So, so that is one way where we could look at optimal and say, look, we've been spending X on this. Is, are we getting the return? And if I'm the head of HR, CFO, how am I going to look at that? How am I going to look at my spend on this software to know we're getting what we need? And, and if we're not, maybe that's an area we go back to that vendor and ask yeah. them, we need, we need greater return on this. So, and that's yeah. I think, an awesome partnership uh, opportunity there. So if, and then the other thing is if you're head of HR and you said this, a lot of HR functions are supporting the different businesses and not each business unit is equal size. So some of these right. businesses could be a drag on HR because if they're consuming a lot of HR resources. So I know earlier in my career, we were fortunate to charge back. So when I was sure. at talent acquisition, we were charging back to businesses for our services. That's one way to look at it. But yeah. how do you think HR can, I, I kind of like this idea, how do we go get funding from the business too for HR initiatives? Because a lot of times HR is being asked to do things and they're looking at their funding and it's like, I got nothing left. You right. know, you think, how do we go get money? Have you seen that as part of that whole budget discussion? Yeah, you know, we had this in particular, this um, consideration when I was at Magnolia, you know, if you're familiar with Magnolia's business, for those of folks who are tuned in, you know, certainly Fixer Upper as a franchise, as a television show is one very, very significant aspect of it. Here in Waco, they have a six acre property that houses a lot of their retail uh, business. And then they have a big significant distribution center that fulfills all of their online and e-commerce orders. They've got a restaurant. Um, you know, there's whole aspects of that business that are super different. And as you might expect in the retail world or in a warehouse, the yeah. resources required to manage those types of roles are pretty different than they are for the creatives at the headquarters or the designers that work under Joanna or whatever it might be. And yeah. so we oftentimes had discussions about, well, how do we make sure that we're allocating that rightly? You know, from my perspective, I'm not a particularly strong supporter of the philosophy behind charging back, as it were. But what we did do was we really just tried to say, look, how are our teams organized in a way that we understand that we are resourcing sufficiently? The person who needs to be at the restaurant at Magnolia Table, you know, that person was literally on the ground all the time. And so we knew that that investment was going to be more significant and you know, particularly dedicated to that business. When you have a hundred people who a lot of times there's a lot of turnover in, those, in restaurants, uh, you know, in that terms of operation. So, you know, it really is, I think, a matter of truly kind of being able to articulate the value that you bring to the entire enterprise. And that comes back to the discussion we were saying earlier, Brennan, is, you know, that, that relationship has to be constant. So it's not just at budget season, it's at every month end when we're looking at budget to actuals, it's, you know, for me, it was a very, very regular cadence of weekly meetings and understanding kind of where is everything going? Like if you're flying an airplane, there's this whole notion of, you know, the rule of 60, 60 nautical miles out from your, your starting point. If you're one degree off, your distance from your targeted destination is a mile. So yeah. you've got to be constantly course correcting as you go. And certainly for us at Magnolia, that was a particularly important thing is we've got to have a rhythm of constantly fine tuning what's going on. And HR, or our people team as we called it there, as with many of the businesses I've served yeah. previously, 
they are always looking at what value are we bringing to the business? What difference can we make to the productivity of our teams? You know, what things can we do more efficiently? And so for my sense, it's going to just kind of be a constant reorientation towards what are our objectives strategically, operationally, and how are we contributing meaningfully to that? And if you can come to me and say, if we institute this particular piece of software, I will be able to dot, dot, dot. Great. That's math that even a brain like mine can do. And then we can properly make an analysis that works. As you were making this emphasis, the light above you is coming in. I think this is like angelic. Preach it, brother. This I'm, is I'm, trying, <laughs> I'm trying to adjust for the fact that the sun's shining through the top part of my window. <laughs> oh, I love it. So I, I love what you just said. It's just constant, right? It's not just a one season deal. It's not just even quarterly. It's constant. And that relationship yeah. has to be there. And I think, you know, if, if you are the senior most leader of your function of the business, that's a high functioning business leadership team, right? Where we're talking yeah. about and, and tension, and I'm not saying tension in a bad way, but just tension mm -hmm. is a good thing to hopefully challenge each other to come up with the best ideas. Because we all know sales and ops, there's always tension there, but the best of ones course. are making each other better, right? That's the goal yeah. here. So, so as we kind of move out of this strategic piece, putting it into practice, so how do we execute? So I'm going to start with just the fundamentals and I'm going to uh, sound super smart here as I say this. I went to HR. I gravitated to HR because I love people. I didn't like numbers. I didn't, you know, accounting was not good. I shared with you earlier, I had to go back in life and like right. take accounting 101 again because I just kind of hated it when I was uh, young. I shouldn't say hate it. I just didn't connect with it. So now it makes a lot of more sense. But I think there's a lot of people like me in HR that gravitate mm -hmm. to HR because, you know, finance wasn't our thing. So but now as we find ourselves getting in these leadership roles, you know, I, I see that finance business finance in particular is more critical. So mm -hmm. it is actually critical as a business leader. So so for those of us that maybe didn't get those fundamentals and now we find ourselves budgeting, you know, what's some advice just to kind of mm -hmm. help us kind of catch up, I guess, so we're not embarrassing ourselves like myself when I was supporting the C, uh, the, the chief financial officer. I embarrassed myself because of my lack of knowledge. How do we avoid things like I've done? <laughs> sure. <laughs> just avoid them. Well, you know, you're, it's such a great question. And, and I think ultimately the way I tend to look at this, and I used to say this both at Magnolia and at other businesses previously, especially with our finance teams, because it, it's sort of like what I would say, if you go to France, you go to France and engage with people in France, speaking preferably their language. And in particular, I mentioned France in particular, because my experience having gone there is if you don't, that's not a particularly enjoyable right. experience, right? right. So you, when you go to the country that you're traveling to, you go and learn to speak their language. And the best way to do that, you can learn, you can take a class like you, you can come to visit my class here at Baylor, of course. Sometimes though you immerse yourself, right? You go into immersion programs yeah. and you just plop yourself in that world so that you not only understand words and lingo and, uh, and grammar, but you understand cadence and you understand context and all of that. So again, that comes back and maybe it's a little bit of beating a dead horse, but it comes back down to that just that continued relationship that gets cultivated. If I'm coming to your world in HR, I need to understand the HR language. And I happen to be a finance guy that loves people too. I'm an enigma wrapped in a conundrum perhaps, but <laughs> it's one of those things that, you know, I need to spend time in those worlds. When I joined Magnolia, they had a program where you know, their, their senior leadership had to go and do front lines training. So you went to every other part of their business and did the work alongside of the rest of the team. And to me, that was a great way to literally begin to get, to, you know, to, to start gravitating towards understanding that language. So if you want to understand finance better, spend time with your finance leader or with their team. If you want to understand HR better, go into that world, spend time with the HR leader and their team. And, and so to my mind, there's no other way to be able to have iron sharpen iron without actual contact. And yes, sometimes sparks fly off of that. Sometimes tension happens, but that is productive, right? And, and that can be, again, presuming that you've, as a precedent matter, established relationship. Then you and I can have a difficult conversation that is productive on behalf of the business and the stakeholders for whom we're responsible. And I think I found, you know, once I got past my uh, bit of codependency and insecurity that I might be revealing myself that I don't know numbers as well, people are willing to help, right? So I yeah. love my financial analysts, right? They would be so helpful to me in understanding, help me understand the numbers, where I'm going. 
and uh, be patient with me as I kind of fumble. Yeah. Through. But I think that's so critical. So, so this leads to that next question of, um, and you talked about language. And so when we talk about, I think just as HR leaders, uh, we, we develop our own reports. And I think sure. one of the things that I learned uh, from one of my experiences was I started, because of my relationship with the financial analyst, I was paying attention to the reports they were giving to the CEO. Uh -huh. and so I realized my reports, at least the quantifiable reports, were looking a little different than what the CEO was always looking at as it relates mm -hmm. to financial numbers. And so when I put our numbers into kind of what he was used to seeing in a financial report, it, 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 it changed the relationship with the CEO. All of a sudden, I think he was looking at a report that was more familiar. Now he was seeing it in a people perspective. So, so yeah. speaking the same language, I don't know, maybe there's a couple of tips where uh, if you've seen some good reports or anything like mm -hmm. that, that, that could help HR leaders speak that language, not to the, just the CFO, but also the CEO. Yeah, that's great. You know, one thing I think is often overlooked in accounting and, and often, frankly, by accountants, is that when we're doing financial statements, the whole purpose of financial statements is for the consumers of the information that we provide. Yeah. And oftentimes we only ever take it from our perspective as the conveyor. That's not the important part. The important part is the person reading the information. So I would say several things. One, you're communicating information in a report to an audience. Your audience's perspective is really all that ought to matter. Mm. And so, trying to figure out not just in providing what but provide so what yeah. like and and this is um in my work with waco ventures here in town the venture capital firm you know i've spoken a lot with our controller over the last year and i said hey when you submit the report and you send out reports to each of our portfolio companies i want you to just take a second in the body of your email and say essentially if you don't read the report that i am sending to you here's what you need to know because then you're going to evaluate one is any of the, does it matter that I'm even sending the report? That's gotta be the first thing. Yeah. And then the person understands that you're trying to put yourself in their shoes and think the way that they think. And so I would say, come to this with, with the sense in mind of what is it that we're trying to convey? And most importantly, when I convey this, what are we actually trying to do with the information that I'm conveying? And then I think sometimes it's just great to ask the people that you're sending it to, how is this report helping you? What do you, you do with this? Do you even look at it? And sometimes we used to play around with this in other businesses. Sometimes when we were sending reports on a weekly basis, we would just stop. And if nobody said anything, we knew nobody was paying attention to the report in the first place. That's great. And so again, you know, communication is all about the recipient of the message, not the sender of the message. If the recipient of the message isn't getting the communication, then the communication is messed up. And that comes from the sender. So uh, last question before we get in the Q&A. So, uh, you know, you've worked with a lot of heads of HR on the, and in, in your career. And so I'm kind of curious, do you have an example where you've seen, not as a subordinate to you, rather just as a peer, have, yeah. have you seen an HR leader kind of grow, grow in this area of business? Because we are so people focused sometimes, we don't grow in the area of business enough. Right. And so yeah. have you seen, I'm not saying you name people or name companies or yeah. anything, have you, have you observed that? Maybe just as an example for those uh, sitting in this, you know, where they've seen them take these steps in growth in their, yeah. becoming a mature leader. Absolutely. I, I, I have in multiple situations and I'm so blessed I've been able to work with you know, incredible professionals in that world. And, and, you know, again, this is the iron sharpening iron notion. They grew, I grew, I've always grown in terms of my better appreciation for the administration of HR or for the people focus on stuff. And sometimes I get out of whack with that and what have you. And yeah, and I guess it comes back to, again, when you do have partnership with your colleagues, there is an exchange that happens all the time. Again, especially if you're, you know, you're particularly intentional about investing in that. Yeah. Like if you and I are working side by side, my starting point is, Brennan, I am here to serve you. I mean, servant leadership to me is such a pivotal aspect of leadership in general. And so I need to be considering what I do, what I say, how I work in the context of how it affects you and how it helps you. And if we're both focused on doing that. It's kind of like in a marriage. If I'm focused on your needs, you're focused on my needs. I never have to worry about my needs. And so, you know, I think if we can be in organizations, help cultivate organizations that are focused on that, 
then at the end of the day, one plus one equals far greater than two. And, and we raise the bar collectively, right? And if you raise two bars and then there's a magnifying effect of that, the bar gets raised so much higher. And I do think that, you know, we never get to the point where we're done learning. We never get to the point where we're done growing. I'm well into the back part of my, of my journey on planet Earth. I'm still learning. I still love learning. And I love learning in particular by engaging with my teammates. And so I encourage people constantly be looking out to improve, constantly be trying to find a better appreciation for numbers, operations, strategy, marketing, sales, whatever it might be. Because again, in the organization, everybody benefits. I just think, yeah, HR leaders are most definitely in a role to model, right? To model humility, sure. right? To model opportunity for growth. So I think that's a great point. Um, thank you for that. All right. So now yeah. we are, we'll get to our Q&A. So hopefully Renee is still with us and can pop <laughs> in. <laughs> we didn't put I'm her to sleep. I'm still here. I could not be put to sleep with that. That was actually very interesting. And I think you probably answered a lot of people's questions as it was. Um, okay, so I do have a couple here for you, though. So from a CFO's perspective, how would you prioritize the different HR budget categories, especially if there's mm. been some pushback and it's limited? Yeah, that's great. Um, so I would say, you know, one thing is that we hire people with the express purpose of keeping them hired. And, and so I think that the focus on recruitment has got to be preeminent, right? The whole point is bringing in the talent that we need. And it's not just about getting people with pulses. You know, that can oftentimes be what happens. I've got the glow on me again. I'll figure out how to <laughs> so do this differently. Right. Um, and, and it has to be focused on, again, starting with strategy and and working through and determining you know as you pulse out the organization's pursuit of its strategy because that's going to be different at different times how do we make sure that we get and retain the right people and so part of that is a notion that we used to use at one of my former businesses at, at, at clarion the leader of that business used to say in our responsibility as it relates to our employees is train them to go but motivate them to stay mm -hmm. and so that's the focus so i would say this that you know it's an incredibly expensive venture, and this is well known. This is not just Michael Rodriguez wisdom, though I've lived it. It's an incredibly expensive notion when you have to have people depart and replaced. So when you have turnover, it is inordinately expensive, and it's something that I do think we should try to avoid as best as we can. So you've got to start at the beginning of that process, defining roles, developing the mechanisms by which you're going to seek talent and search for talent, secure them, compensate them, and ensure that you're not only training the talent that you bring in, but then investing in your manager. So I know that that's maybe not necessarily a quantitative answer, but those things are how I'm going to focus on prioritizing how we look at outfitting the budget within our human resources team. Well said. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you. The next question is, does the CFO view it positively or negatively? if HR pushes their budget items with them? So if someone keeps pushing it, is that a good thing or a bad thing? How far do we go? Oh, sort of like my kids sometimes. Yes. Um, right? <laughs> you know, I, I, I am always willing to have a good, robust dialogue. And, and, and I'm always also, well, I shouldn't say always, I try to be open to being wrong and, and also to taking risk because we never have benefit, we never have profit if we don't pursue risk at some level. Uh, you know, one of the ways that I've done this in the past, and particularly at Magnolia, just because it's much more um, recent, we would always talk about within the team when we're talking about making an investment in people, make an investment in a department or a cost center or whatever. I would always bring us back to, hey guys, we've got $1. Like that's all we got. And so what we're talking about right now is who gets the dollar. And of course we always had more than the dollar, but the point was, that what we're trying to make a decision on is not whether or not we invest, but whether or not we invest at the expense of perhaps something else, because we don't have an infinite supply of dollars, no matter who you are, maybe if you're Apple or Google. But it, so you, you have to still be able to have that discussion. I oftentimes like to take a position as a CFO and say, you know what, let's go ahead and give it a shot for most types of initiatives. I do it a little bit less so when we're talking about human beings. But I'm like, OK, let's go ahead. Let's give it a try. Let's go procure that software. Let's go ahead and make the change in our procedure and our policy. 
let's give it a try because most things in business that we decide are not kill the company types of decisions. And most things, I'm an Apple user, so undo is command Z, right? Most things can be command Z. We can undo a lot of things, not without perhaps repercussion, but they can still be undone. And so I would rather um, have a difficult dialogue and I would most times capitulate and not saying that I'm a rollover or anything like that, but I wanna trust my teammates. I wanna trust their instincts, their experience, their expertise. And so long as it isn't the type of thing that could be potentially a company killer, I'm like, okay, let's give it a try. Now, of course, I know not everybody's like that. Just from my perspective though, I think that's a better, healthier, potentially more profitable way to operate in the long term. Awesome. All right. Um, that's uh, one more, Renee, or the last one that came in is uh, who from HR do you feel is validated to approach the CFO? Oh wow, wow! Um, entering the king's court, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not, not in the least. Please don't stop the video with that statement. Um, <laughs> I, I have always, I have always, always had an open door policy. I have always, when I've joined every company that I've joined, I've visited with, in, in, you know, on the teams for which I was responsible, I visited with everybody in every part of the organization. I don't care how high up or how low you are in the organization. Everybody matters. So I don't care if you're an HR specialist or you're a benefit specialist. You've got a question for me, come on in, let's talk about it. If you've got a challenge, come on in, let's talk about it. If you want to argue with me, that's fine. Argue honorably, as will I. And, you know, of course, there's still a hierarchy in business. There's still a, a sense of authority and responsibility, both from a legal perspective, but also a practical one. And so I'm on the hook to make certain decisions subject to the levels of authority that are stipulated. But I, I never begrudge anybody from coming in and wanting to share with me. And look, I've done things in my career that I like. I can't believe I said that. I didn't realize that I said that. But I want my teams to be able, everybody's teams to be able to come in and say, hey, when you said that, by the way, that, that really kind of struck a bad mark with me. Man, I, I, I'm sorry about that. Will you forgive the fact that I said that? Because that was not what I was trying to say. I flubbed it. Um, so I think everybody, and again, this is my personal leadership philosophy, everybody should be able to enter the hallowed halls of CFO or CEO or whatever. And I've been blessed. I've worked with virtually every CEO that I've worked with, every CXO that I've ever worked with has approached it that way. I think, you know, in 2023, if we're not operating in that context, and I think we're just kind of shuttling ourselves back to the not particularly good times within the 50s and before then, I mean, those were great eras, don't get me wrong. But in that particular manner, um, I, I just don't think that that's the best way to operate. Command and control, right? Which we've moved away. Yeah, that's right. yeah. The corner, the corner office with the name on the door, the door that gets slammed shut when they walk through, and yeah. you know, I, I don't even want a door on my office, quite honestly, unless I have to have a private conversation. And even then, I want my windows like we had them at at our old company we worked together at Brennan um, at Directbit when we had all glass. I was like, I love that. That's better but at least they have a private conversation. But I want everybody to know my office is always open. That's awesome. So thank you, Renee. Thank you. I know we're a little bit past time here, so I think it's time to wrap up. But I, well, what time I, wanted, I know, right? It goes fast. So, but I wanted to say, this is so timely, Michael. So thank you. As, as we kind of said, as we were chit-chatting before, I was hoping 2020, going into 2024 would feel different than going into 2023. Yeah. We still have this air of uncertainty. So I think everything we've talked about today is so relevant. Uh, because I think there's going to be a lot of challenging discussions right now, like, you know, uh, as opposed to, let's say, three years ago when things were growth trajectory was looking much more positively. So right now, there's gonna be a lot of conversations. and I think this is just so timely. So I'm so grateful mm -hmm. uh, for you taking the time to talk to us. And yeah. it's always uh, a joy to be with you. So thank you for your time. And I want to thank everybody else uh, for joining us. And I really hopefully you, you're taking away a few good points uh, from this dialogue. And once again, we're recording this, so this will be uploaded uh, in a few days, and we will notify you when that happens. So I hope everybody has a blessed and awesome day, and thank you for joining.
Thank you. Thanks, Brian.